This is Shane Worthner, creator of Athletistry Ballet Strong, and you are listening to Green Room Conversations. I'm joined by my amazing wife and fellow former professional ballet dancer, Mari Claire Delis. This is the show where we tell you everything you didn't know about ballet, the good, the bad, and the fun and the sad. Come along and experience the dance world through our stories. If you laugh, learn, and love the time you spent with us, all we ask is that you share the conversation with someone else. We promise you haven't heard a dance podcast like this one before. Here we go. All right, Marie Claire. Well, it's been, look, it's been a little bit of time since the last time we did a podcast, but yes, it has. I think it's important this one tonight. Um, I want to talk about strength training for dancers. I'd like to talk about how dancers are being trained at all at the moment. Um, and I think there's, there's definitely some stuff that we can bring up and, and there's some stories that we can tell about our backgrounds and our, our uh, time as students. Oh, as for well. sure. There's always stories. Always stories. Always stories. Lots of stories. All right. Hopefully people like our stories. Yeah. If you guys do like our stories, be sure to subscribe so that you uh, get notified every time that we release a new one. Uh, and if you are really enjoying it, all we ask is that you share this with a friend because that's what helps us to be heard by other people as well. So definitely share what you're listening to and uh, let's get into it. So strength, uh, I think, first of all, let me, let me preface this with the, uh, the side that my background now for the past uh, almost five years has been as a personal trainer. Uh, and that came on the back of my career ending in 2017 as a professional ballet dancer and having danced uh, not on one, not on two, but on three different continents. So having had quite a range of experience of how different dancers train, how different dancers uh, approach fitness and how rehabilitation. How different continents approach how, yeah, it all. Yeah, exactly. And very different from um, Europe to the US to Australia. So I think, you know, the first thing that I think is really important is that, and, and this is something I think to, that we definitely have to acknowledge, is that it has improved considerably since I was a student and definitely since I was a professional dancer the um, understanding of how important strength training is in relation to your dancing. Yes that's true. I think um, there still could be more emphasis on the training aspect of strength rather than just saying oh you need to be stronger um, I think that there's still guidance lacking in that whole strength arena, um, but it has improved greatly, that's for sure. Can we, can we debunk some myths? Because I think this is really important. Yes. Uh, first myth that we have to debunk is that if you lift weights, you'll get big, bulky muscles. <laughs> oh dear, how many times was I told that as a young uh, aspiring female ballet dancer. Yes, um, that one's definitely come up quite a lot. It's like, do you don't want to make your muscles too big? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think it works that way. <laughs> I know better now. Because of all that testosterone that's coursing through your veins as a as a teenage girl. That's right. <laughs> and even as an adult, as a as a woman, as an adult, the amount of testosterone that's coursing through your veins is is nowhere near the amount of as, as what a man is, and so. You're, you're just naturally not as the term being anabolic as a man would be. I think the fear might come a little bit from, first of all, a lot of misinformation about um, strength training and weight training, but also um, with what we see in front of us, when we, when we do look at a female bodybuilder or even just a, a female um, gym fanatic, yeah. um, it's very different to uh, the aesthetic of <laughs> ballet dancers, ballerinas in particular in this case. Yep. Um, why is that, Shane? Why is the aesthetic so different? What's going on there that, that, that makes them so, um, what's the word? Defined. Defined, yeah. I think, yeah, muscular definition is, is probably the key there, right? Like what, what we're seeing is 
very, very, very low body fat percentage with uh, a well-defined muscle um, muscle set. So would you say that some female bodybuilders, um, is, is that natural what they're achieving or is there something else going on there? Oh, look, there are definitely going to be those that are using uh, performance enhancing drugs. Absolutely. But not everyone. Not everyone. Uh, and there are there are plenty of um, fully natural female um, weightlifters out there that are not uh, overly thin, uh, that are not competing as bodybuilders, right? So there's a, there's a difference, obviously, between a weightlifter and a bodybuilder. So what gives them that um, bulkier look then? And why has that transferred over to ballerina, ballerinas who don't want to get that type of muscle build so they shouldn't lift weights? Well, what, what they do is they train in a method um, called hypertrophy training. And what that does is it puts the body under stress for an extended period of time. So it's a very specific way. It's a of very specific way of training. It takes a really long time. Like if you look at if you look at someone who's who's wanting to get into bodybuilding, the prep time to to even their first um, show show is going to be twelve to eighteen months. That's a long time. That's a long time. Not only are they are they in the gym probably six days a week for two to three hours a day building for that over the, over the course of those very specialized uh, specialized uh, training period but they're also on a very specialized diet to help them to lose body fat right right so the appearance is going to be something that is is what they're looking for training specifically to look that way whereas if you go into the gym and you pick up a barbell and you put it on your back and you do some squats the likelihood that you will end up looking like a female bodybuilder is... Or even a gym junkie. In even a gym junkie is, is quite low. Right. So um, is there this... Um, can it be said that you can stretch your way out of those bulky muscles? Like, for example, are they stretching the way a ballerina would stretch? Well, stretching, stretching isn't going to change the shape of your muscles. Right. The, what will change, if there's going to be any type of shape change in, in your musculature, it's probably going to come from many, many, many years of training in a specific way. So, for example, doing ballet is going to develop a specific look. Doing, uh, you know, playing soccer or running is going to develop a certain look. Riding a bike. Oh, so riding a bike. So I was told as a young dancer, don't ride the bike because your quads will get big. Yep. Now, of course, we look at the Tour de France yep. and we see bikers, yeah? Yep. And some of which do have bulkier thighs, yep. right? So the fear is there like, oh my God, because they're biking all the time. If I bike too much, I'm going to look like that. Well, I think right. the key the key phrase there is biking all the time. Yeah, so we're doing ballet all the time as opposed to biking all the time. So doing a quick 30-minute bike ride for stamina and um, and cardiovascular, cardiovascular improvement. improvement is not going to lead us to the Tour de France. Uh, highly unlikely. <laughs> Uh, and if it does, then, wow, you're really talented. Maybe you should go to the Tour de France. Again, you know, they're probably spending two to three hours a day at, at, the, at a minimum on right. their bike. Yeah, that's a lot more than I would have spent. <laughs> and, then, and then on top of that, doing highly specialized weightlifting for increased quadricep development. Right. And so, so using your bike for half an hour for um, stamina and cardiovascular improvement is not going to bulk up your quadriceps. No. Right. Okay. So myth busted. Myth busted. All right. All right. So that's the first one. The second one, and I think this is this is this is uh, something that that actually came up early on in my PT career. I was uh, running the conditioning program at universities here in Brisbane, and the uh, one of the dancers asked me, "Isn't it true that if you use resistance bands instead of?" Um, like dumbbells and barbells, that you will develop longer muscles. <laughs> right. So those um, those those therabands that we use for strengthening yeah. our feet, these sorts of bands. Exactly. Right. Okay. And so, are you going to miss? Are you going to bust bust that myth? <laughs> I am going to bust that myth. So that's a tongue twister. It that's is. Uh, resistance is resistance. Is pretty much the way to look at it. If you're putting your body under resistance, seven pounds is going to be seven pounds regardless of how you look at it. 
uh, 15 kilos is 15 kilos regardless of how you look at it, right? So if I'm, if I'm picking up a 15 kilo, kilo dumbbell or I'm putting a 15 kilo uh, band uh, resistance on my body, the only thing that might change is where that resistance hits in the range of motion that I'm working for. And that's pretty key there, range of motion as well. Range we'll get of into motion. that later as well. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you can't change your muscle shapes based on resistance bands versus uh, s traditional weights. At the end of the day, you really can't change mus much about your muscle shape. So that's genetic. The shape is genetic. It's what you're born with. What you can do is... Um, so you can you can make it thicker so you can thicken the fibers of the muscles um, you can make it stronger all right so um you said you can't change the shape of your muscles but if you do specialize in a certain sport or ballet for example so let's let's take um swimming versus ballet yep. yeah so because you're when you're swimming it's very arm dominant of yep. course there's legs involved absolutely but because there's a lot of arm involvement swimmers do tend to have that um uh, stronger looking shoulder right. so i i actually had very broad shoulders for a female yep. i often used to think my head just looked too small because i had these broad shoulders and it was actually a point of um uh, what is it when you feel a bit self-conscious about it? So a point of like contention or something in myself yep. um, that I thought, oh my God, I'm much too broad. Um, had I been a swimmer, I might have actually been quite a successful swimmer because I was already naturally broad. But um, yeah, so you said you can't change your muscle shape. Well, can you change your body shape depending on your training? Well, what will happen is certain muscle groups will develop more than others potentially. And, and this actually takes me into an interesting discussion. One of the, one of the uh, students that I'm working with at the moment has been having some knee pain. And her physio has told her probably quite, quite correctly that the um, muscles on the outside of her quadriceps, so there's four muscles in the, that, are, that make up the quadricep. And, uh, Hence the word quad. Quad, exactly. Right. So the one on the outside, the... Um, um, is a brain fart. Vastus, right vastus lateralis. <laughs> the which one again? Vastus lateralis. Right, okay. Uh, has overdeveloped a little bit as a result of her, her training in a turned out or externally rotated position. Which is natural, right? Which is, it's exactly how it's supposed to be, but what will happen is because that's one of the muscles that controls the ah. way that the kneecap tracks, her kneecap is now tracking more to the outside as opposed to tracking straight. Right. And so, so it's being pulled in one direction because of that overdevelopment of one side. That's right. Right. So not, not that that's a problem for ballet, but when she then starts to work in parallel, she has pain in her knees. Mm -hmm. And so considering that she's probably not spending 24 hours a day in ballet and needs to be able to walk in parallel when she's not dancing, there's knee pain that's being caused by the fact that that part of the, of the leg is being overdeveloped. Right. And dancing then would become some type of evil villain in this sense, like you're... You're, you're you're hurting yourself dancing so you, obviously it's the dancing that's doing it which sure it is right but it can be easily fixed yeah. um, or trained yeah. um, if you then well we then have to we have to look at the uh, vastus medialis oblique which is the muscle on the other side so the one on is the, that inside. the teardrop one that's the teardrop so that's the one that creates that little uh, teardrop looking um, indentation just above the kneecap yeah mine's nowhere near as defined as a teardrop <laughs> that's right go find one of those uh one of those images of a bodybuilder online that everyone wants to not look like and be able to see <laughs> exactly very, what very we're talking defined, about so you'll yeah. know exactly what we're talking about yeah see they're there it's there in all of us yes that's right yeah. the teardrop all, exists the muscles are there they're just not necessarily developed oh so like the six-pack <laughs> exactly uh and so and so in that sense, you know, the muscle, the muscle is there to pull the kneecap up and they balance each other out. And mm. so this, you know, this brings in a, an interesting um, discussion point about balancing your muscle groups. Because one of the things that I, I see a lot or even hear a lot from dancers is that they're told not to use their quadriceps when they're dancing, right? To... to to stretch. Well, that would come from that fear of wanting to not overdevelop them and have these big, 
Tour de France biker type bodybuilder quadriceps. Yeah. Which is, we've already discussed, a, a, a myth that's been busted. Yeah. We can't actually look like that unless we try to look like that. Unless you're training specifically for that outcome. Right. So there's, a, there's an idea in, in training called specificity, where the, the, uh, the training that you're doing should be specifically, specifically related to the, um, the area that you're trying to specify in. So, for example, if you're wanting to become a better dancer, then your training has to have some relation to dance. If you're wanting to become a better runner, then you would have training that related specifically to running. Right. Uh, if you wanted to be a push-up master, you would do lots and lots of push-ups, <laughs> right? Are you sure you didn't, wouldn't just run on the treadmill for that? Well, you would probably find afterwards that you had gotten very good at running and not doing push-ups. <laughs> so, the running would improve, but the push-ups would stay the same. Unless somehow you were running in a push-up position, which, oh, which wow. would be quite challenging. Wheelbarrow! <laughs> right. So there's, you know, there's this aspect of specificity where the training has to relate specifically to what you're trying to improve. Right. And it's, it's interesting for me because what we see a lot within the dance world is uh, students who will spend uh, up to 10 hours a day in a dance studio. And, and they're, you know, they're, they're getting very good at their skills. You know, maybe they can do lots and lots of turns or their jumps are improving. Uh, they're getting very good at at doing the elements that dance requires, but then when you ask them to go and do a variation, or you ask them to put those elements together in a more challenging enchaînement, or something combination. where combination where things are coming together, uh, they run out of stamina. The coordination falls apart. Maybe they don't have the strength to get through an entire class. Or possibly they start even forgetting the basics because they haven't. They've, they've been so used to what I see is certain combinations, but they don't mix it up enough with different types of lead-ins to certain steps. Yep. I've noticed in, in, in my teaching over the last few years that there, uh, some students are very, very rehearsed in a certain combination and it never really varies. But in all honesty, you can do anything in ballet yeah. and a teacher can ask you to literally do anything and sometimes when I've mixed it up a bit and given them a little less um, common combination everything just falls apart yeah. because that that neural pathway of the correct movement um, and sometimes the reverse of that correct movement is just not there yeah well, the movement, the movement is, a, is a pattern, right? And what, what we're all trying to do as dancers is to master the patterns of dance. Um, and there's a difference between mastering, mastering a movement pattern and remembering a certain um, combination. Or exercise. Or exercise, right. right? So, like, you can have a mastery of different movements and be able to string them together effortlessly, or you can have a remembered almost regurgitated version of a combination. That kind of like done. memorizing a song or a poem or something. Exactly. But then ask you to mix up the words and say a different story and it, you might not be able to. That's right. Right. Exactly. And so what, what I find is because, because there's not a mastery of movement underlying dance, there's that struggle there. And then, and then you know, stamina and strength come into play because when the body is uncomfortable, it relies on what's in the background. Right. Right? So one, one of the things that I always find interesting is that when you first ask a dancer to squat, they struggle massively because they haven't actually learned the natural movement pattern of, you know, bend the knees and, and sit backwards. What they've Funnily learned. enough, though, you ask our children who are six and nearly two in August to yeah. squat, and they have a perfect movement pattern. That's right. Why is that? Why do kids have that perfect, and I mean young kids, have that perfect movement pattern? Yeah. Yet older kids, let's say up, up 10 and upwards, yeah. have lost that. Why well, can't they do it anymore? First of all, they stop practicing it. Oh, right. So well, the, the method of, of uh, getting down to the ground and getting back up changes as you get older. Uh, and, then, and then you lose that practice of squat to pick up. The older you get, the more you creak too, right? Yeah. <laughs> Although hopefully that's not happening at the age of 10. No. Yeah, you wouldn't want that. 
but yeah, so you start to lose you start to lose that that natural movement pattern that babies have, uh, and especially if you're training in ballet, you you're told from a young age, don't stick your butt out, don't break at the hips, keep everything in one line, mm. and then you start to do a squat, and it's you know you have to break at the hips, but, you, know, you can't keep what, everything in one line. What is a grand plié though? Well, it's it's the same it's the same depth of movement. Right, well, and this is where it gets really interesting. It's about range of motion and strength through that range of motion. So if you don't have strength at, at a deep bend of the knee position, because maybe you only do four grand plies on each side in a class, and you're not challenging your body to get down to that depth, when you then have to do a grand plie in the center, it's very difficult. Mm. Or when you have to do a deep lunge in this, the grand port de bras, of the Vaganova method, it's very difficult. Well, what I find actually is um, going around that grand plie is that while as dancers, you try and get a dancer to squat and they have trouble doing it because that natural hinge at the hips with the, with the hips going backwards, that sticking your bum out, so to speak, is kind of like pushed out of us not to do that. Yet, I find so many students as they do a grand plie, they lean forward, and what happens? Their butt comes out. Yep. And which is ironic because we're told not to, yet they can't squat and do that when they when they need to. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's it's actually one of the things that I um, I, I make a a point of when I teach is is that straight going down and not moving that posture. Right. Um, it's actually really hard to do, and it changes where you feel. Yeah. Your grand plie. Well, it's why it's why when I work with dancers, I don't get them to squat traditionally. I have them squat differently. I have them squat with their heels elevated. Right. Because what that does is it allows them to keep their upper body straight. Like you would in a grand plie. That's right. And so you're working more on the quadricep strength specifically as opposed to it shifting into the glutes or the hips. Yeah, and I and I see definitely see that um, in in the in the effort to try and do that grand plie when they don't quite manage to keep that posture, you can feel, you can see that it does go into the, the glutes yep. um, rather than the legs where they need that strength for Grand Allegro later on. Right. Well, and, that's, and that, you know, that makes an interesting point is when you look at jumping, for example, uh, if, you, if you ask someone to jump who is not dance trained. Really, really high? Really high. They're going to, what the first thing they're going to do is bend forward. They're going to stick their butts out. Their arms back. are going to swing back. And then in order to get into the air, they're going to uh, what we call extend their hips. So their hips are going to push forward. Their glutes are going to uh, engage. engage. And they're going to jump into the air. And if you watch, most of them are going to keep their feet flexed. So most people don't jump with pointed feet, except for dancers. <laughs> because, Gee, I wonder why we do that. Because <laughs> when dancers jump, they can't stick their butts out. And so what it does is it actually f takes all of that energy out of the most powerful part of the body, which, which is the glute and the hips, right. and puts it into the quadriceps, the calves, and the feet. So you're going to need strong quads. You're going to need strong quads. You're going to need strong calf muscles, and you're going to need strong feet. Wow. All right. So um, the squat, it's pretty important. It's very important. Right. But, when, but done specifically. Specifically, specifically to, to your, dancers. To, to your... To your uh, to your, what do you call it? To your, to your craft. To your craft. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. All right, so, you know, taking it, taking it one step further, because there are lots of different um, methods that dancers train in at the moment. Outside uh, of the studio? Outside of the studio. And that's, that's not to say that, that any of them are necessarily bad, but what I find is missing from most of them uh, with the exception of strength training specifically, is a periodization of their training. So what is periodization? What does that mean? Uh, basically, you set a period, a period of time where you're working towards a specific result. And you track the intensity of the training. You track the volume of the training, so the amount of training that they're doing. Uh, the intensity would be the difficulty. And you track the amount of time that they're spending on that training. So what would be a result? Like, um, give us an, uh, an example of what a result would be. Um, increasing jump height by five centimeters. Okay, well that's very, very specific. In, a six, week, in a six week process. Okay, and so how would you go about something like that? Just, just off the top. 
very basic. Uh, so you start with the test because you, you need to know what your baseline is. Right. Um, you never test jumps more than three times because okay. past three times the nervous system fatigues and then you're not able to get a, an accurate read anymore. Mm. So you always test it um, maximum three times to try and get a, a max jump. Um, once you've once you've achieved attained that height, uh, and you know, okay, well, in six weeks, I want to increase that by five centimeters. Now we know what distance we need to improve by. So, for example, let's say you could jump twenty five centimeters into the air, and you want to get to thirty centimeters in six weeks. You know that you have to increase uh, by around half a centimeter every week for the course of those six weeks. Okay, so um, would there be specific muscle groups that you would work on or would it be very, very um, specialized to the dancer? Because obviously every dancer's anatomy is a bit different. Some have what we, you know, what we might say shorter Achilles or, um, or range of motion in the, um, in the ankle, in the ankle sure. to, to, uh, to combat. Um, so how would you go about then the next step? Yeah, so you, by, 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 by making it very specific to that dancer. You would, you would test them in multiple areas. So you would test, you would test mobility of the ankle. You would test uh, quadricep strength. And that will determine the outcome of the type of program that that dancer would need to. That's right. So you could have two dancers with the same goal, yet the program could still be very, very different. That's right. right. Because one dancer might have strong quadriceps but limited ankles, and the other dancer might have um, very, mobile, very ankles. mobile ankles, but weak quadriceps. Right. Right. So, the the types of exercises that you would do for each of them would be very different. And then each week, each week you would you know you you track their their workout, so you'd make sure that they were doing the exercises. Obviously, that's the most important part. Well, if you don't do the exercises, you don't improve. You're right? not going to improve. <laughs> You would track you would, a little bit wishful thinking. <laughs> you would track their perceived rate of exertion mm -hmm. and their perceived rate, rate of difficulty. So that's how you know what their what their intensity is. So, like, say um, you're testing me for my perceived rate of, of exertion. Yep. How would you ask? What would you say? Oh, I'd say you know, on a scale of one to ten, how difficult was that? And I, if I say, oh, it was about a six. Okay, so we write down six. Okay, and what does that mean? It's it's an arbitrary number. So there isn't necessarily like a, okay, well, that means that you have to do there this. There isn't a graph that goes along with each number. No, but for example, let's say, you know, you Wait, do... Are you trying to get an 8 out of me or a 10? Not or? necessarily, no. but we want to see an improvement every week. Right. Okay. So for example, what we would want to do is, let's say we, got, we went week one, week two, and it was the same program in those first two weeks. Mm -hmm. Week one, we would ask you, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, how difficult it was. And let's say we had an average difficulty of seven. Okay. We would want by week two that that average difficulty would go down. Oh, okay. So not up. No. Because we want you to be improving. Oh, so you want it to get easier. We want it to and get so easier. And so that's when you then say, okay, so it's gotten easier for you. Let's up the ante. Let's make the exercises more difficult. Right. And then, of course, you go back to it. Oh, my God, that's what the seven again. That's right. Eight. That's right. right. So the number itself doesn't actually matter. No. Right. It's, how we, it's how we know that you're ready for improvement. Oh, okay. Good. Now, look, there are lots of ways that we can do that. There are lots of ways that we can track that. Um, another way that we can do it without necessarily asking for that number is uh, to see how well your uh, increase of weights is going. So for example, if you started with one, kilos, one kilo on uh, day one, we would like to see you in increasing by day four or day five to two or three kilos. So this is like really reminding me of when I did actually work with a personal trainer um, in the gym, but I didn't do it around ballet, but it seems to be the same type of method. So it's, it's really no different to how you might train an adult who just wants to get stronger in the gym. True. True, except the, the major difference there is that the goal is obviously different. Right. So instead of training for body composition, which is generally what most, most adults train for. Is that to, bikini body is going to come. To yeah. look good in a bikini, That's right? That's right. I mean, the bikini body is made in winter. That's right. That's right. So I better start getting, getting my we're, body We're on. in winter now. If you guys want to look good by Christmas, get started. <laughs> That's right. Get started yesterday. Um, but yeah, the, the, uh, the general goal for, for most people is body composition, whereas for dancers, it's to improve their craft, their dance, right? right? So 
I'm not looking at when I'm working with a dancer um, necessarily their body composition as much as I'm looking at um, instabilities, um, muscle weakness on one side versus the other. So whereas well, that would make a big difference in your extensions, for example. Yeah. So like if you're or even arabesques. If your right hip flexor is much stronger than your left hip flexor, your right leg is probably getting much higher than your left. Oh, it's like you just read my whole history. I was always much better with the right leg than I was with the left, and I never knew why yeah. <laughs> until I started doing bar with my ankle weights. Yeah, well, there you go. I mean, and, and look, there's there's a good example of a way that you can that you can meld the two. Like if you're time poor, you can bring weights into the studio. You can challenge yourself to do bar with with ankle weights on, mm. or even if if ladies, if you're working on swan leg, put the put them on your wrists. Oh, that's what I used to It'll do. It'll make your arms strong. Oh yeah, just putting them on for bar. And um, I took them off, and by the center, my arms were so light. I, I literally felt like I could fly away. It was great. I loved it. Yeah. So, you know, I think I think that that's definitely something that that all dancers should work on. And, you know, the question obviously that that most most parents out there are probably thinking is like, so what? When should we start it? You know, is it something that they have to start at fifteen, sixteen? Yeah. What age would you say? I I would say that basic movement patterns and basic strength development, not necessarily with weights, but basic strength development should start around five or six. Uh, and then you want to start looking at adding in some light resistance because if you start at that age, the movement patterns are going to be very well ingrained by the time they get into puberty. So how do you, how do, you do that exactly? I mean, we know, you and I both know how challenging it is with a five or a six-year-old to... Uh, to get any type of movement pattern out of them. Yep. Um, our daughter is six years old yep. and um, her movement patterns are all over the place. Um, as good as she can do a squat, it's not consistent right. as far as you know, up and down knee tracking and, and she's like all jelly and everything. Um, not only that, but making it fun. I mean... Games. Oh, Lots of games. Games. Yeah, when, when it comes to training that age, you got to have a lot of games. Right. And, and the, the more fun, the better, because you don't want it to be work at yeah. that point. You want it to be um, just enjoying the movement, um, finding a way to make it engaging and, and keeping them um, playful right. in that sense. Well, we know that Dominique, she responds a lot to a little bit of a feisty competition as well. Yeah. So anything about, like, I bet you I can do more, will kind of get her rearing to go. Yeah. Right. So if you if you know if you build that strength patterning at a young age, and then and then as the dancer gets older, or the child gets older, you can you can start to um, bring weights into the equation because, again, you're going to have to uh, you're going to have to use what's called um, progressive overload. Right. And what about boys? Boys, boys should should start. I mean, at the same same age, five, six. Because up until puberty, girls and boys, their their strength to weight ratio is about the same. But what about weightlifting, specifically boys and partnering? How does that all um, well, blend in? Well, it, it, weightlifting needs to start when partnering starts. So, and probably a bit before. I mean, ideally, you're looking 12, 13. For, 12, 12 or 13 to yeah. start with the weights. Yeah. Very, um, very light. Light weights. Very light. You're not, you know, you're not about to load. You're not going to load 20 kilos on the back of a, of a 12 year old. No, not unless they have the, the muscle to handle it. Which some do. Some I have do. seen some 12 year olds who are impressive. Definitely. Um, and again, that doesn't mean that at 12 years old, you're going to look like Arnold if you're lifting 20 kilos. You know, it's going to take many years of, of development and training and, and um, um, proper uh, coached and, and guided training in order to develop that strength. Right, so um, even the, oh my God, his name is failing me right now, Royal Ballet. Um, Stephen McRae. Stephen McRae, thank you. Yep. God, it's, it's late. <laughs> my brain is not working. So even Stephen McRae has come back from an injury recently. I think we talked about him maybe in the first podcast that we did. Yep. Um, coming back to him a little bit, I seem to remember him posting about how much he undertrained, even as a principal dancer, and how yeah. thin and skinny he was. 
and how that made him so prone to injury. Yes. Um, so you've really got to watch out while trying to maintain that um, the, the, the life and malleable body that you're making sure it's actually supported by the muscular strength because he has come back now um, definitely looking much stronger. Yep. Um, but also him saying that he feels better than ever right. and healthier right. as well. Right. And um, there's a definite visible difference in his body composition. Yeah. Um, he looks really good yeah. um, from doing that. So he, I think he has a documentary coming out soon as well. Yeah, I'm not sure what, it, what it's called. Well, but we, it's... Can, we can definitely update the podcast with that once we know for sure what it's called and when it's coming out and where you can view it because I think it's a really good one. Yeah. It looks to be really good. Yeah. I think um, what, is, what is important about that, right, because he, he ruptured his Achilles. Uh, so many dancers think, oh, you know, I don't need that because I'm not injured. I'm always healthy. Mm. I, 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 I'm fine, right? Until you're not. Until you're not. And then <laughs> and, and that can happen on stage in the blink of an eye. We would both know that. <laughs> and and how many dancers then are are almost like reborn into this understanding that strength training and um, conditioning their bodies for the work that they're doing is so important that they would rather do that than go to daily training. Yeah. Right, like there, how many dancers at San Francisco Ballet used to religiously go to active care? Uh, with active care was the best. With, I, just, look, I have to interject here. With active care was the best. Yeah. <laughs> uh, before they would, you know, before they would go and take ballet class that morning, mm. or or even uh, would go and do a floor bar that would help to stabilize their body before they would go and do ballet class. Right. Right. Because some of them went to do gyrotonics. You know, let's let's be honest. Ballet ballet in the twenty first century is not the same as it was uh, even fifty years ago, right? We've we've progressed the intensity, we've progressed the challenges that we're asking of dancers, we've progressed the amount of shows that we're asking them to put on, um, and and we're pushing the body further and further and further with a more intense. Well, like uh, any extreme sport, we just keep like aiming for that Guinness World Book of Records type um, uh, level of achievement. Right. Not that we are actually in the Guinness World Book of Records. Oh, I think but... I think there is. I think there's one for the most pirouettes or something. Yeah. Okay. But pirouettes. <laughs> that's not. That's um. That's just pirouettes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, pirouettes is like one tiny drop in the ocean of ballet. I think it's. I think it's just like most consecutive turns asked for by a ballet, and it, it, I think it, it mentions Swan Lake or something. So. So as much as we may not be in the Guinness Book of World Records, the extreme amount that dancers are being asked to do these days is requiring a higher level of physical capability, and that's that's improved. Uh, tremendously in the past, even the past five years, the level of, of technique and the level of ability in dancers has just skyrocketed. And so in order to continue to, to keep up with that, we have to be well-oiled, well-trained, well-developed bodies, which means that our cardiovascular fitness has to be on point, our, our physical strength has to be on point. And if it's not, you're a ticking time bomb waiting to get injured and end up on the sidelines. And not on point. <laughs> and exactly, and that's and that's exact that's exactly right. Because how many times does someone get injured and and then someone gets their place? Oh yeah, it happened to me. I I had quite a few of those moments. But then it also happened in the reverse. Someone else got injured and I got my chance. Just like you've written in some of your blogs yeah. recently about chances that you got from other injuries and illnesses. So um, it works both ways. You can lose it or. You can use it. Well, and what I found what I found absolutely fascinating about San Francisco Ballet was that that almost didn't happen in the time that we were there. It was very rare, especially in the upper ranks. Right? When you looked at the soloists and the principals, they all stayed pretty healthy. Uh, and they all went out and trained on their own and they took care of their bodies and they saw physio and they, they got acupuncture and they did their gyrotonics and um, you know, they, they were... Yeah, the most injuries did happen, I think, in the core divide. In the core. Now, yeah, that's... But also, I just have to say in there, they were overworked, that core. They were. They were, definitely. 
So there wasn't maybe the time for them to develop themselves physically because they were so exhausted from the amount of work they were doing in the Absolutely. studio. Which I think is also important. You have to you have to find a way, even even when you're tired, to strengthen yourself. Now, this is something that I think is is important because what you'll often find is that people will say, oh, I don't have any time. I don't have any time. And no, no one, I understand that No one, one has any time no. until they're injured. And then when they're injured, it's like they've got all the time in the world, but they can't do anything. <laughs> that's not true, though. We know that. You can, right. you can train through injury. That, that's right. But what I was going to say is but that... But hopefully you don't want to get injured anyway. What I was going to say is that if you, if you periodize properly, what you're able to do is then to taper off the training and allow yourself to improve for the performance. So one of my theories around training dancers is that if we add in strength training at the beginning of a rehearsal period and we ramp up that strength training all the way until about two weeks before the show and then we cut the strength training back, we don't have to cut back the rehearsals because we know the rehearsals are going to ramp up. But if we cut the strength training back just enough, they actually are able to have a taper before they get to the performance. So they peak physically just at the right time. So could you call the performance an exam as well? Yeah. Seeing as we're in Australia, we know that um, there are very specific periods of uh, exams, Stedford's concerts that we're always working towards. Um, and so how do you manage to go through the exam period, the Stedford period, the concert period? There's always seems to be something. How are you gonna to manage to get your strength training in when you're always working towards something? Well, as long as you're doing something extra on the outside, you're going to be improving because you're overloading. And, and again, it's, it's um, progressive. So it's not like tomorrow you're going to add in seven training sessions. Maybe you start with one a week mm -hmm. for two weeks. And then in week three, you add two sessions. And then in week five or seven, you add three sessions. Now, it, it's really hard to get... Um children i mean we we talk about children until the age of what 16 18 18 yeah 18 all right let's let's take 18 as the as as the top of the, of that um category it is quite hard the younger the child obviously and we're talking in that prepubescent pubescent time um to get a child to understand that they need to do this because a child of that age feels completely invincible let's be honest mary claire it's hard to get anyone to do exercise. <laughs> okay, I see what you're saying. I'm guilty. <laughs> <coughs> yes, I must, I must raise my hand to that one. Um, you're absolutely right. It is hard to get anyone to um, exercise. However, the adult seems to have that sense of responsibility. Like, yeah, I know I should, but... Yeah. Okay, so they take that responsibility. The child, however, we both know with children that getting a child to do something that they really should be doing for their body is like, you know, like trying to get them to brush their teeth or eat their broccoli. Yeah. Yeah? How do you, how do you go, go into that? Well, that's where I think when you start working with a child as a coach, it's your job to, to set a really clear goal or to help them to set a really clear goal. Because when it comes back to it and they start to say, oh, I, don't want to, I didn't do it this week, it's like, well, how much do you want that goal? How, how badly do you want to be able to do five pure at some point or to be able to um, make it into that performance with Queensland Ballet or Australian Ballet or, you know, maybe Bolshoi comes to town and you get to perform with them, right? If, well, hey, that happens. Absolutely, it does. So if, if you set a very clear goal and you set something that uh, is going to inspire the child to want to improve, and you set a clear connection between achieving that goal and doing the exercise, the likelihood that they're going to follow through with it is going to be much higher. Right. If there's no, if there's no correlation, if it's just pain for pain's sake, no one's going to do it. There has to be some sort of reward at the end of that tunnel. And then what happens is, without really knowing it, is that you get so used to doing it that not doing it feels weird. But that takes that takes three, four, or five months of consistency. You can't do it for two weeks and then stop for four weeks and then do it another one for a week and then stop for two weeks. So, it doesn't work that way. So what's your opinion then on holidays? Kids going on holidays and 
um, you know, with their families to the beach or something like that. What do you say about that? Would you stop drinking water because you went on holiday? Well, Would you stop brushing not. your teeth because you went on holiday? Okay, so... You... Would you stop eating food because you went on holiday? Right, so you're saying it should be just as, as routine as anything else you do to care for your body. That's right. And that's dancer or no dancer. That's right. I see. Well, I know where I have to pick up my socks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, it, and again, it really depends on what you want to achieve. But if, if you are saying to everyone around you that you want to have a professional career in dance, there is no time to rest. Yeah, okay, so I also, in remember, that sense. I also remember being a child and um, for the dancer, for the child who wants to become a dancer, unfortunately, in one sense, you know, we say unfortunately, but it's not because it's a very fortunate opportunity if you can get there. Um, but that does come with a bit of sacrifice. Yep. Um, one might say that you sacrifice your childhood for it. Would you, would you agree with that statement? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Did you sacrifice your childhood for ballet or for dance? Oh, look, there were so many Saturday birthday parties that I didn't get to go to because ballet had to happen, right? Yeah, no, I remember I had the same thing. Um, in fact, I, got, I was pretty happy you know, towards the end of elementary school when the birthday parties started becoming sleepovers and we, we were you know, starting at 5 o'clock in the evening instead of 9 o'clock in the morning because... I ended up getting to go to those parties as opposed to not being able to go. Um, and then, you know, the, the things like moving away from home at a young age and um, potentially missing out on school dances and that kind of stuff because it's not, doesn't happen. And you, you're out of school dancing all the time. So a school <laughs> dance isn't like, really... Hold on, what's a school dance? I, I, it's school and I dance. <laughs> this is what I do. What do you mean? It's every day. You mean people do this for fun? <laughs> It's not always work. No, but that's, you know, that obviously that is, there is a part, that part of it because it's a young career. Because it's it not, it's a young career. It's sure. not something that you can do until you're 65 and then retire. You know, it physically. Oh, well, ah, Margot Fontaine. <laughs> it's not something that most people can do. There's, no, there's a right. hand, there's a handful of people in history that have danced until that age. That's right. Right. Yes. And, the majority of dancers just don't don't get to that that age and continue. So I think even in Paris, they um, they cut they, you off at forty two. They, they cut you off like literally. You're done now. You're retiring. Bye bye. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which seems brutal, but you know if you're making it to that at twelve level, and you know. Well, the difference the difference also there is that they, especially I think if they're French, they get a pension for the rest of their life. Yeah, well that would that so, would be nice. So there's a there's a. <laughs> There is a slight difference there, but the the average dancer doesn't make it past thirty five. Right. Well, I know all about that. Yeah. Well, so do I. I didn't. You know, both of us I think retired at thirty, more or less. So there's there's that there's that hidden knowledge in all dancers that this is not going to be forever. And the ones that want to make it professionally know that if they don't spend the time in their youth, that it's fleeting. It it won't last, hmm. right? And you know, I know there's a lot of talk at the moment about university and should you go to university or should you go to a company. You know, I think that it's a, that is a very personal decision for each dancer to make. There's no right or wrong answer. It has to be right for for you individually. However, if you know that you want to dance in a company and you have the capacity to dance in a company, go for the company and figure out the university while you're there. Well, that's why San Francisco is so good. Yep. Um, because they did offer that uh, university integration type program. I, I can't remember what it was called. Um, but They had a connection with St. Mary's College, yeah. Catholic University. And yeah. a lot of dancers did university degrees alongside of that hideous quarter ballet schedule yep um every sunday sundays Ugh. so they gave up their what their day off yep for to, 10 years to, for 10 years to study yeah so there is no day off right oh dear so there's no there's no holidays there's no time off what a life huh yeah but it's a short one yeah
But then, you know, after 10 years, they had a they had a degree. They had a degree, and they could go and do um, something else. One of our friends, actually, um, just graduated. She's, she's married. She has um, a son who's, I think, a little bit younger than our son, and um, she's just graduated holding her son. She was so proud to do that, um, hold him at her graduation, and now she's uh, retired from dance to this year. Yep. And... And off she goes. Yeah. And I think that's just amazing. That's wonderful. I, I would actually wish that I had done something like that, but it wasn't around when I was young. Right. Um, I would always suggest that a student, um, if they want to pursue dance, then absolutely go for it. Make that your priority. Yeah. But have another passion as well. So right. Find something else that if, if I asked you, if you didn't have ballet, what would you do? What would you be? Well, and I think I think that ties you know ties nicely into the idea of strength training in relation to dance as well, because if you want to stay healthy for as long as possible and give your career as much longevity as possible, then you want to suffer as few injuries as possible, because the more injuries you have, especially in your youth, the more they'll plague you once you're a professional. And so if you're if you're twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen and you're already dealing with bad ankles and bad knees and bad hips, that's not going to get easier as you get older, right? There's an underlying strength issue there that needs to be remedied. And as much as there are ways to do that, like Pilates and um, PBT and yoga. <laughs> yoga and gyrotonics, None of them have the systems and the processes and the tracking that is inherent and inbuilt into strength training. And so in, in a art form that is known the world over for being terrible at tracking progress, yeah, this is not new information. <laughs> no, like... This is not brand new information. Constantly <laughs> dancers are saying, I'm not getting any better. I don't know what I'm doing. How am I improving? Why I can't get through this variation. Why not give yourself a system of training your body that is designed to track progress? Just from the ability to write down the weight that you used and the amount of reps that you did and the amount of sets that you did. It's very mathematical almost. It's like... There's no, there is no clearer system. You don't have to reinvent the wheel here. You don't have to make it crazy. It, it's as simple as track your sets, track your reps, track your weight. How long are you exercising for? And track your progress. And track your progress. And when you do that, you can see the results. Well, there you have it. And those results will keep you healthy, and they will keep you dancing, and they will keep you able to improve your skills in the studio so that when the time comes, you're ready to be a professional. Well, even in the, in the, in the off chance that then you are injured, um, because you are so physically capable and physically fit, your injury will be so much easier to overcome That's and right. so much quicker to uh, recover from if, right. you're, if you've already got all of those patterns That's right. um, ingrained. It's not, it's not about having a magic bullet. Right? It's, not about, having, no it's not about having some secret that's, that's going to get you more than someone else. What it is is this clear-cut process to create the best possible environment for your body to assimilate dance technique. Because at the end of the day, and this is probably a, a discussion for another podcast because I don't want to go off on this tangent. At the end of the day... Having strong technique and the ability to execute all of the skills and, and movements with ease is what allows you to develop artistry. I definitely agree with that. Artistry is um, separate but intertwined in, in the ability to do it, right. to, to, to execute what you need to. Because if you are so caught up in trying to do the movement right, you're not going to be able to tell a story with it. Well, there you have it. So there you have it. I mean, it just so happens, and here's, here's my, uh, my shameless plug, <laughs> is that I have a whole system, guys, an entire system 
of how to train. Shameless or shameless? Shameless. <laughs> uh, an entire system of how to train, an entire system of how to improve your strength, specifically for dance, utilizing strength training, utilizing movements that train your body in range so that you're not just working on shortening your muscles, you're actually developing the muscular strength um, in that range of motion that is needed by dance. And what's it called, Marie Claire? The program that we have developed. Oh, well, ballet strong. <laughs> there you go. Oh, I have one more myth that I'd like you to bust. Yep, go for it. Last one. Can you tell me what short twitch and long twitch is? Short twitch, um, slow twitch and fast slow twitch. Slow twitch and fast twitch, that's right. Because I've heard that slow twitch is, um, what is it that I've heard? Fast twitch is, is being able to move fast, yeah. whereas slow twitch is like if you're doing like a quick leg or something. Um, and slow twitch is, is, I don't even know, but there's something going on there with the slow twitch and fast twitch. Can you yep. please explain what slow twitch muscle, muscles and fast twitch muscles are, please? Yeah, so they, they call them type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers now. They don't, they don't use slow and fast twitch as right, much but anymore. but it still lingers, the yep. slow twitch and the fast twitch. It yep. still lingers within the ballet realm. Yep. Um, could you explain what that means? Yeah, so um, fast twitch muscles are the ones that um, are your power muscles. So they're, they're the larger, um, thicker muscle fibers because they're the ones that give you power and strength. Uh, whereas Can the, you give us an example? Uh, if you're doing a very heavy squat, your, your um, fast twitch um, muscle fibers are going to be the ones that are being activated for that, right? right. Because they are the ones that come on quickly and so, hence the fast yeah and die out quickly all right so they they they're used fast right as well so they they switch on fast and they also exhaust fast right okay now slow twitch they're the endurance muscles right so what's an endurance muscle then um well you you'll have all all muscles have a balance of slow and, and fast twitch okay. right. so like your quadriceps are going to have different fibers built into them that that make up the muscle belly right and they will have a different percentage but depending on the shape of the muscle so um, for someone like me who's long and lean i have more endurance muscle than slow than fast twitch right what about me um, you know how i used to dance you might have slightly more fast twitch than slow twitch yeah i was definitely a sprinter I was not a long distance. <laughs> so, I could do a variation, but the thought of a pas de deux would actually like make me afraid. <laughs> I didn't have incredibly high, high powerful jumps, but I could keep going for a very long time. It's true, yes, you could. Right. Nice. So think of th think of the slow twitch muscle fibers more like the Energizer Bunny. For those Americans out there. Or the Duracell Bunny. Or the Duracell Bunny for <laughs> for everyone else in the world. <laughs> Just keep going and going and going and going and going. <laughs> right? And um, the fast twitch ones are the ones that just come on and, go and, and switch off. But they're the ones that also give you a lot of power. So, so that would be why I had a good jump and I could get through and, uh, a very quick leg or something. Yeah. Because I had a good jump. So that would be why I had a good jump and I could get through a variation very easily. But then why I had trouble with stamina and getting through something that was long and heavy and hard. And I just felt like I wanted to pass out most of the time. That's it. Right. Okay, so myth busted that fast twitch has to do with moving fast. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it could give you an increase in speed, a sudden increase in speed, but they're not. They're not going to. But it's not what makes you move fast. No. So it's not like turn on those fast twitch muscles so that you can do a really quick petit allegro. No, it doesn't work that way. Okay. That's right. that's going to be how quick your your neurons fire. And also one one other thing, push ups. Yeah. Are they for your biceps? No, not at all. So they're not necessarily for you know. The biceps, the biceps are are what would be called the um, the antagonist muscle group. Meaning they're the opposite muscle group to the one that's working. <laughs> 
So you think you're working one, but you're actually working something else. Right. Well, the bicep, the bicep in a push-up, obviously depending on on the alignment of your arms, the bicep may do some work to stabilize the shoulder, but predominantly the the muscle groups that are working, that are doing most of the most of the stuff, uh, is your is your pectoral muscles. And then you're going to have some synergist muscle groups in there, like the triceps and the and the um, the anterior deltoids. Right. So, so to sum up everything we've talked about, first of all, we've we've busted a lot of myths about um, what your body's going to look like if you do strength training. And we all have a six pack. Is that right? I remember you saying recently. Everyone, everyone has something similar to a six pack. It may be four. It may be eight. It may be twelve. But again, that's just going to be genetics. But it's all there underneath it's all, there. all of our stomach, uh, skin, and body fat. That's correct. Okay, so um, that six pack that you want, you already have. You just have to uh, bring it out. <laughs> that's right. Okay, what else have we talked about and, and discussed? Um, how important how important strength training is for absolutely. for longevity, for skill development, for technique, and periodization. How how you know period periodizing a program so that you're getting the best out of your strength training, um, and so that that strength training is specific to what you're trying to achieve as a dancer. Um, All right then, I think um, we've covered a lot of ground tonight. Yeah, and. Um, as always, I always learn something when I talk with you, even though you've probably told me all of that stuff before. Sometimes it all feels like brand new information. <laughs> <laughs> and that's for all the friends, fans out there. Um, yeah. We often bring a, a little bit of a friends reference every now and then. Yeah. Die hard friends fans. Yeah. Um, all right then. So. Awesome. Well, thanks, Mary Claire, for chatting with me. Always. Always. We always chat. And thanks for listening, guys. And again, if you have enjoyed this podcast, share it with a friend because that's how we are able to help more people. Have an awesome time wherever you are, wherever you're listening in. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, night, and uh, talk to you soon.